Welcome to Marketing with Confidence. I'm your host, Marianne Amies. We're going to be talking all things digital and online marketing for business owners and marketing professionals. If you've been feeling overwhelmed by your digital marketing, be sure to listen along and you'll hear tips, interviews and more that will give you the confidence to create marketing you love. Welcome back to the Marketing with Confidence podcast. I am so excited to be joined today by Cherie Clonan. Hi, Cherie. Thanks for joining me. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Really good. Really good. That's good. Well, look, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, obviously, I know you quite well, and I'm sure lots of other people do too, but I'd love to hear how you came to carve out your space as a proudly autistic CEO of digital agency Powerhouse, The Digital Picnic. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, know you very well. I think we even um, exchanged and I love you we most have. recently. Yes. <laughs> most recently, yes. <laughs> um, definitely a peak, like a, a highlight for me for 2023. Uh, <laughs> I love you too. Thank you. Um, Thanks for this public forum as well. <laughs> it was such a sweet moment. It was peak us. Um, yes. But, um, yeah, I obviously am eight years in, nearly nine, um, to you. heading up the digital picnic and, I, I think I knew that I was going to do this even back in the, you know, the relevant tertiary qualification <laughs> day. And I just remember sitting there thinking, and I'm sorry to make this podcast slightly sweary, but I just remember thinking this yeah. curriculum is shit. Like yeah. it was outdated. Um, it wasn't very practical. I felt in a way, in many ways, it sort of set me up to fail. Yeah. And I just remember thinking um, this isn't serving people well and they're walking away with these massive, obviously, you know, um, hex debts or whatever mm. that got going on and it just didn't feel very fair. And I also could empathise um, with the, you know, um, the institutions that digital moves so fast that you yeah. can't update it quick enough. So I just remember thinking I'm going to teach this one day. I'm going to teach the practical. I'm going to nail it. I'm going to make people feel so empowered to feel safe, you know, yeah. literally in the industries as marketing practitioners and digital marketing practitioners and, I thought to myself, I'm just going to commit to serving some time and actually making this a career first that I actually have some some authority yeah. you know, by the time I taught it. So, yeah, I just, I know I, I was sitting on this way before this was this, you know. Yeah, and yeah kicked it off, started teaching. Um, that went so well that, you know, people just naturally said, love everything you're putting down. Can you manage our marketing yeah. for us as well? And that was sort of like, I guess, yeah, the second era of TDP where we actually managed um, digital marketing efforts yeah. for our clients. And and now it's sort of feeling like a bit of a happily ever after. Not as yeah. much this year because, you know, <laughs> economic downturn, but like I still, even in the ugliness, I still think there's a bit of a happily ever after in there. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, amazing. And I think you're right. Like the education piece is so interesting because like you, like us, would see graduates come through all the time. And you go, you know, oh, did you guys cover this? No. Did you guys cover anything on analytics? No. You think, how long does it take to catch up? Like it's, you know, it's been a solid decade of digital first. And yeah. I, you know, yeah. And it's just, they want more too. I remember yeah. being the person who did graduate and I um, got handed an, um, you know, an EDM list of 250,000 plus subscribers to manage Mm -hmm. uh, and absolutely no practical experience yeah. having done anything with EDMs ever. Yeah. Uh, and I just sat uh, at my desk one day um, and actually it was after hours. I was home um, and trying still to figure out after doing a full day not knowing what the flip I was doing. <laughs> I just burst into tears. I walked down to our local supermarket and I was just like, I, I don't know what I was just like pouring <laughs> through the aisles, not even really knowing what I was doing and, I was crying, you know, but not overtly, like just had the sort of the teary kind of eyes and bumped into someone um, that I knew who was also in marketing and she was like, how are you? And I just did this very embarrassing, I'm not well. And <laughs> I cried, um, told her what was going on. She dropped everything, came to my house right then and there, taught me oh, everything wow. to do with that ADM. Um, I set it up, it went live, um, and that I just literally needed someone to show me yeah. what to do you know oh one 100 I think I being just that little bit older than you I had like my whole corporate career didn't even really touch digital you know it was sort of 
an agency would do this or an agency would do that. And even then, like we didn't, we didn't even really know the full scope of what we could achieve with it. And, you know, the agency kind of, you, you trusted in them, you trusted that they knew. So yeah, by the time I was sort of faced with doing hands-on, it was all just learning as you go, lots of Googling, lots of, lots of trial and error. Absolutely. Thank God for YouTube. But also I want to be the agencies who were around then when people were just like, we trust you. I know. I know. But that's that that whole era and like of people coming to us now and being like, our first website cost us $30,000. And you're like, sorry, what? It's five pages. It's like, (laughs) how? And it's just that those agencies that got to leverage off that zero understanding of digital, like it was all smoke and mirrors, you know, it's very complex. It's very, you know, it's very big. It's very hard. And they must have just like completely like cash cow raked it in. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah, that would have been such a profitable time. Yeah, what a time to be alive. <laughs> yep. 30K for five pages. I, I want to go back to that era. Uh, I know. Like I could just happily build three websites a month and just, <laughs> and just shut up shut up shop and be a literal millionaire all by myself. Like, amazing. Oh, my gosh. Let's do it. <laughs> the sleep, the sleep we'd actually have. <laughs> so, look, as the CEO of your business, I mean, we kind of do some of this together, but. I'd love you to share, you know, how you balance working on your business and in your business. Yeah, I know. I <laughs> Do I have the right answer for your audience? That is the question. <laughs> I'm in a weird spot at the moment and I'll share it honestly because maybe mm. there are some of your listeners who will benefit from this. But I was always like, yes, yes, yes. The holy grail is to get to the point where you work on rather than too much in. But I'm yeah. at this weird sort of point in my journey where I went too far away from the end and our business hasn't hasn't fared well, you know, too far away from that. So I'm back in and on Um, and I'm not micromanaging or I'm not like, hey, give it to me. Nobody else knows this is all mine. It's nothing like that. But I have noticed even from just a spreadsheet, you know, perspective, a P&L perspective that it's making a big difference having me back in. Yeah. Um, And so I guess, yeah, I'd start by sharing that. Maybe some of your audience are like, I'm meant to not be as in as this. And I say to some people, maybe you are just a little bit more, you know, don't buy all of the Gary V kind of stuff, you know. (laughs) Um, Because I kind of did and just thought, oh, right, this is meant to be the holy grail. And then it didn't do well, you know, Um, just didn't do well. Um, Well, No one loves it like we love it, you know, like, there's those rare unicorns which we hear of, but you know nobody loves it like we love it because we wouldn't have stuck with it for so long through the the good, the bad, and everything in between. You know we don't we don't get to just go to to LinkedIn and find something better and move on. You know we stick yeah, with sure. it and we cry our eyes out, we tear it down, we rebuild it, we try again, we get back up, and I think. Yeah, expecting somebody else to have that same dedication and passion for it. You know, I think. Yeah, it's not fair to them, is it? Like, no, no. You know, um, so I I guess balancing the on and mm. in, like, I'm in a better spot. I think I like to be a little bit more in than others. And, you know, that yeah. just that is happiness to me. I'm not going to say that that's what everyone's meant to be, um, you know, uh, sort of working towards. But for mm. me, think I need to stay in um, and have the right level of on so yeah for me it just looks like owning what is business ownership happiness to me and it's not yeah. dipping away from all of the in because I actually just really love it there I'm a very happy autistic woman when I'm in and usually the stuff I'm in on is definitely part of my autistic you know set of autistic special yeah. interests so like why not why not just let me be happy you know? <laughs> don't hold yourself back from it no, not at all. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. Um, what about morning habits? Now I know that you and I differ in our uh now that we've we've lived together in our I love you stage for a very sh- couple of short periods, we differ in our morning habits. <laughs> talk, talk to talk to everyone about your morning habits that set you okay. up. <laughs> I think you might be referring to my 4 a.m. starts. Yeah, correct. <laughs> But I don't understand your 4 a.m. starts paired with your midnight bedtimes. Like I just, 
<laughs> um, that is not a norm for me. I don't like a mid midnight finish. Um, mm. I will do it when I'm around really good people. So that mm. is a testament to who I was around on the leadership retreats. But yeah, I'm I'm an early my morning habit looks like a really early start because my husband will testify to the fact that I am out cold by something like 7:45, 8:30. <laughs> so yeah, she she peaks early. Yeah, wow. <laughs> but, um, but I it used to be a 5 a.m. start, um, but I'm hitting like perimenopause and it's just waking me up really early. But yeah. I'm not unhappy about it. Like I'm not yeah. waking up angry or honestly not even tired. Like I'm yeah. just this weird time in my life as a 40 year old woman um and I'm not sure what it is or what yeah. the future looks like but for now I'm just well as we're interviewing this is my perimenopausal bed I have been <laughs> removed from the main last <laughs> <the master> suite <laughs> because of your early rising it's just like you're killing me, kid. Because <laughs> I'm like, hello, <laughs> good morning. And you also rise early and you're on. Like I know you I, don't have a warm-up face. <laughs> you have experienced. I'm like, hello. <laughs> Very Mrs. Doubtfire cream. Yeah. Like, hello, dears. <laughs> um, so I've been, yeah, you know, um, demoted to the fold-out bed here mm-hmm. in this spare room of ours, and I kind of like it. It's just a weird, cute, perimenopausal time in my life where yeah. I'm, um, you know, just uh, waking up from this fold-out bed and taking out my Mrs. Doubtfire on the computer here and <laughs> being like, um, let's do it. And really interesting, big, innovative, creative, strategic, big-picture things are happening in that time. Wow. And I'm, I'm weirded out by it, and the more I learn about neurodivergent circadian yeah. rhythms I'm realizing I've found my time and yeah. it also means I just have to go to bed pretty early yeah. so yeah, yeah. That, that's my routine yeah I love it I completely cannot relate but I absolutely love it for you <laughs> <laughs> even like you are you know obviously fueled by coffee and then every day someone put in a coffee order I'm like oh just a hot chalky um, marshmallow I know I know again how did you only have four hours sleep and now you have the audacity to only drink a hot chocolate like it's like you're rubbing your morning effectiveness in our faces in every way possible (laughs) I do I am powered by a a, a 3 p.m 2 p.m you know something caffeinated like just to have one and this is please no one take this as hashtag fitspo it is the very opposite (laughs) wellness advice I am just, I am Sarah Wilson. I'm um, over here with my 3 p.m. bottle of Fanta. One of my literally. most beloved girlfriends, uh, very yeah. well known for the, like, the three litre Fanta from 9 p.m. to get the uni assignment done, like, before the early a.m. So I always say, hey, yeah, just grab a three litre bottle of Fanta and keep going. Respect the Fanta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. No, I think that's really good, you know, good. And and I've obviously listened to your content before about how you found that that morning part is so effective for you. And, and I think it's really important for people to acknowledge where that is for them and, and maybe to try out different times and try to work out what's your, you know, your highest productivity when you're when you're firing at your strongest and and readjust around that. We get you know, we obviously get fed the, the the rules, you know, the rules of business ownership, the rules of all these things, whereas we need to lean into our own rules, our own body, our own, you know, our own mind as well. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I can't, I, I don't know if I'm going to try the 4 a.m.s, but it's, it's, it's an interesting theory. <laughs> that's the thing like I think shouldn't we all as you know CEOs or um whatever we want to call ourselves managing directors whatever we are yeah. business owner if if there's sometimes not a lot of other amazing things <laughs> um yeah. you know attached to business ownership the very least we can do is work when we are best suited to working yeah. right like is that not the just the best thing that we can do and so I mean for other folk like like uh, someone else on our leadership retreat she strikes me as an 11 a.m 11 a.m start kind of gal yeah. Yeah. I love that about her. It's just big yeah. energy, you know. Yeah. Just, yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I love four or five AM. Um and but in, in saying that, I absolutely sleep in on the weekends. Like when I say yeah. sleep in, it's like six thirty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you rebel. rebel. You rebel. absolute rebel. Do you get to sleep in the big bed on those days? <laughs> I do. I'm allowed. I'm I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Absolute love it. Absolute love it. But you're right, our, our, that that big sis energy of 11 a.m. But as the business owner being able to say, you know what, my business doesn't start till 11. You know, my meetings don't happen before 10 because that's, again, when I'm going to be in my best frame of mind. And I think, you know, sometimes, I mean, my journey as business owner, I've forgotten often that I'm, you know, the business owner and not an employee. Like I'm such a diligent employee, you know, I do my best to turn up at nine, <laughs> like, but it's not, you know, we have that flexibility and then we, I guess we have to give ourselves the permission to embrace it as well. Absolutely. Oh, I, can, I just completely relate. <laughs> <laughs> We're good employees. Yeah. So obviously, you know, I could have had you on here today to talk about digital marketing. And I know that you and I could probably talk on that topic for absolute days, but one of your special interests, passions, and I think one of the areas outside of digital marketing where I've learned so much from you is your absolute devotion and nurturing of diversity and inclusivity within business, within life, you know, within everything. So I thought rather than, you know, getting your top tips for Instagram in 2023, what I really love to hear from you is, you know, why CEOs really need to up their game and start paying attention and nurturing diversity and inclusivity. Oh, yeah, it's an incredible topic. And I still feel like I'm a baby ally, but gosh, I'm a passionate one, you know, and I guess for me, it started like it, it really kicked up. I guess, a gear when I put my kids through the mainstream school system. And, you know, we um, started off at a school that felt fairly diverse, you know, Um, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And I really attributed that to like a change in organisational leadership. And I realised, whoa, wow, organisational leaders have the ability to literally change like Mm. You know, through yeah. their either um, allyship towards, you know, um, yeah, the yeah, inclusion or or completely just removing themselves from any of that responsibility whatsoever. And now we've been on the receiving end of what it felt like for that shift. And, the yeah. school, you know, it. long story short, and this is, you know, a whole other chat for you and I on <laughs> a leadership retreat sometime, but, you know, um, it really did reach the point where it became unsafe physically yeah. and um, mentally for my children to attend school, like literally yeah. unsafe yeah, physically and psychosocially. Uh, so I just think who, if we're, if, if anyone cares about legacy, is that what you want your legacy to be? Do you mm-hmm. really want to become someone who's responsible for carving out a genuinely unsafe people, a uh, place for people to yeah. be? you know, because I know I don't. And so I started looking at TDP really differently. I think we were always doing pretty well there just through um, me showing up, someone with an entirely different set of lived experiences. So therefore I think I walk a better walk and talk a better talk in those spaces just because I, in small ways, I'm marginalised as well. I'm still Mm. a very privileged white woman, but I'm, you know, marginalised just by my neurodivergency. And um, I just looked at TDP with a whole new lens and I just thought I want to make sure that the place I'm creating um, is just consistently showing up and always saying when I just wake up every day committed to knowing I'm not doing good enough, I've got to do better, yeah. you know. Um, and only as recently as this week we had an innovation day, you know, with our team and uh, we all picked a value, our company. But I know this sounds so daggy, but it was it was honestly special. Like, And we picked a value that TDP has within a set of, you know, company values and mm. one of our values is inclusion. And um, two people chose it and when they talked about why they picked it, they actually referenced um, that they felt like where they worked just is literally a, an incredibly inclusive place mm. and like, the reasons why and I couldn't stop smiling from ear to ear because it wasn't, um, it was so genuine, you know, yeah. and they really meant it. And um, for these two women, it just meant so much for me to, for them to say that, you know, so yeah, um, yeah that's, that's how I always want people to feel. Um, I want people to feel really safe. And I think in 2023 and beyond, it's just not acceptable for um, leaders to yeah. not show up in in this way and in this space um, as well as we could all be doing. And, yeah, I want to be on the right side of history. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I mean, having the, you know, having the foresight 
to see that and acknowledge that because often, you know, the people on the wrong side of history are, are the ones that don't even know, you know, and I think any small step that you're making is always going to be putting you in a more positive place. And and I think, yeah, it's interesting because I don't, I've only sort of, and I should have realized sooner, but, you know, only in the sort of last year or so come to think about schools as businesses, you know, they are businesses and we don't think they are. I, you know, I think, well, maybe it's early this year, my daughter is due for like enrollments for year seven. So we had to go back through the whole, you know, school showcase stuff. Yeah. Um, and we we sat through one principal's address and I thought, oh my gosh, this is a business. She's pitching us. So she like, you know, and I'd never thought of it before. And, and again, you know, that, that leadership in that organization, it impacts the, you know, impacts so many people of future organizations as well. Um, I couldn't agree more. And it's like, it, you start to see how dangerous it is when you see mm. them as business leaders, because yeah. I've heard, I've seen, I've lived firsthand, but I've also heard um, through some really great friends of mine who work in the DEI and these spaces that mm. there are almost no settings more homogenous than the school yeah. setting. You know, principals hire people who look, feel, and sound like yeah. them. Yeah. So then you've got it, teachers, like kids are looking at teachers that don't represent them, whether yeah. it's their, you know, their skin colour, their um, religious um, beliefs, mm-hmm. like. Um, uh, do you have neurodivergent teachers um, yeah. representing, um, you know, like autism on the stage or ADA, you know, just like yeah. there's so much you can do. And I just think if we all committed to, um, you know, sort of, yeah, getting the hell away from that homogenous hiring and um, yeah. creation of a really homogenous like environment, um, we're on a much better path. And so that's, that's again, what I want for TDP. I want to, I want to be surrounded by people who don't, look, feel, and sound like yeah. me. Yeah. A better person. Yeah, 100%. And then you're learning, you know, yeah, and, uh, you know, that desire to always be learning. You don't learn when the people around you are you. You know, all you do is confirm whatever biases you already have in place. Oh, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I think for businesses to move to that nurturing of diversity and and really leading for inclusivity, I think it comes with that confidence and and that empathy piece that we love. So what are your top tips, I guess, for leaders that want to move into this space and want to lead more effectively, you know, through confidence and and through empathy? Yeah, I I've been on a really interesting journey with this because I think at the start I loved the hell out of my empathic leadership yeah. sort of presence but then there was a stage where I didn't love it mm. like, on reflection um and through an amazing <laughs> business coach <laughs> that we share I've realized you know there's empathic leadership and then there's ruinously empathic mm. leadership and I think I was in the ruinous kind of um space of yeah. empathic leadership and it just well it doesn't feel amazing for me but it's not even great for the people that I was managing, you know, because yeah. it's just a whole lot of people, please. It's it's yeah. toxic, you know, um, it's all of that. So I think for anyone who wants to honestly show up as an empathic or, or at least dip into more empathic quadrants within your, you know, your leadership style, I would say do a lot of the work first on yourself to know the differences between, you know, empathic mm. leadership and what would look like ruinously empathic leadership and just... um yeah, when you know the differences, it's a whole different feeling. It's a whole different workplace. It's mm. a really constructive leadership style. And now I am getting on to the other side of it all and I, I recognise that I'm a servant leader. Yeah. And that's very different to what I used to be, which was a servant leader who wasn't actually a servant leader. I was just a people pleaser in disguise yeah. and saying, oh, I'm a servant leader. No, I wasn't. I was a reckless, ruinous people pleaser, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm on the other side of that now. And so I just love being here. It feels like genuinely empathic leadership um, and empathic towards myself too. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. I mean, obviously, yes, I also can tick the box of the people pleasing <laughs> empathic leader. I, it, I think it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's tough. And I think there's a, you know, it's almost like you go from baby, baby business leader to you know, teen business leader, rebellious teen business leader. Maybe we're we're, we're coming into our you know, I don't know, comfortable cool thirties business leader. <laughs> we haven't hit their don't give a shit you know 
But, uh, you know, I think that baby leader stage, I know for myself, I didn't want them to not like me because if they didn't like me, how would I get from them what I needed to get from them? And, you know, you blur those lines of friendship and, and you know, leader to to um, employee relationship or team relationship. And it feels great when you're in it because, you know, you're having fun, they're having fun. No one's in, you know, no typical conversations ever have to happen, <laughs> which is yay. It's so great. It's like sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, like, but it's not real, you know. No, um, it's it, just you, yeah. it chips away and then you're like, yeah. oh, none of this was real, you know, and yeah. it's really hard, but it's like an awakening if yeah. I, I've just hit 40 and I've heard this is the awakening or something. Yeah kind of scared of maybe why I'm on the fold out there. <laughs> um, but you know um yeah it, it's happening and it's like you it's happened yeah. in my leadership journey as well and I'm so happy to be on the other side of the sunshine and the lollipops because yeah. they weren't real no um, I don't even if we were chasing friendship you and I both know we didn't have real friendship we had no. people crossing boundaries I was crossing theirs it wasn't yeah. great it wasn't constructive it yeah. wasn't going to build something amazing and it will fall down when you get to a particular size in your business where you realize I can't duplicate this yeah. 20 30 40 times over you know yeah that's so true yeah and and if their you know their willingness and their motivation is built on that personal relationship to you where you're feeding everything to them but they're not necessarily feeding anything back you know, that, yeah, you can't scale that because you can't have that relationship with 20 staff, 40 staff, 30 staff. Um, You'd have to clone yourself and that's literally not possible. So it's better to find something that's more sustainable. And Cloning myself has been a dream of mine for a long time. <laughs> oh my just... God, I would be a billionaire. <laughs> like, not right. that, by the way, but I, I, if I did somehow find the billions, I would allocate them to literally cure the world from itself but yeah we would yeah. like cloning would be amazing oh cloning would just be yeah absolutely like absolutely amazing like and you yeah. could actually be in all the places that you want to be and do all the things you want to do um but maybe perfect the model first just a little few more tweaks before we yeah. <laughs> maybe oh that's what God. we're getting ready for maybe it's coming and this is our uh you know stage where we're getting ready to so have the perfect model to clone <laughs> yeah yeah I agree <laughs> Awesome. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for this chat. I think it's so, you know, lovely to hear and you're always so honest and I appreciate that. And I think, you know, so lovely to hear about your journey through business ownership, but also, you know, what you're passionate about and, and how you're striving towards that. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. It was so great to be here. Hey, thanks for listening to another episode. If you don't want to miss one, make sure you subscribe to the show in your podcast app. And if you love it, be sure to share it with friends and colleagues who you think could benefit from increasing their digital marketing confidence. Want more? Head to MarianneAmys.com to find out how you can work with me directly, to reach out to have me speak at your event, or to grab yourself some free resources.